Welcome to this uh, CERTL Teaching and Research Alumni Panel. And we're going to get started with a little bit of an intro to CERTL and how to um, interact in this Blackboard Collaborate environment. So my colleague Miranda is going to give that brief introduction. Hi, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Miranda Davis, and I work with the CERTL Network. Before we get started with the event today, I'm going to give a quick um, overview on how to use Blackboard Collaborate during, a, during the session. So to the top left of the screen, you'll see the audio and video panel where the video of the current speaker will show. And then um, in the participant panel, you'll be able to scroll through that and see the list of everyone um, in the session today. And then you can also use the chat window to either ask a question or if you're having any technical troubles, just let me know. Next, I'm going to cover a couple icons um, on the audio video panel. As a reminder, you can use the talk and the video icons to turn your camera and microphone on and off. Just note that there is a limit of six videos on at the same time, so be sure to mute um, your camera and your microphone when you're not speaking. And then I'm going to cover a couple different ways to interact during the session today. Uh, we would love the panel to be highly interactive, so just let us know if you do have a question. And to raise your hand, you can click this third icon that looks like a hand. Uh, just be sure to lower your hand when you're done speaking. And then you can use this fourth icon here to respond to a poll. If you hover your mouse over that icon, you'll see a drop-down menu, and then you can submit your polling response. And then again, you can use the talk and the video icons to turn your camera and microphone on if you do have a question. And then just let us know if you do have a question in the chat window. The last icon I'd like to cover is um, how to type directly onto the whiteboard. If you use this, this icon that looks like a capital A with three lines, you can double click this icon and then click the whiteboard and drag to create a text box. So if you do have a question, you can ask your question directly onto the screen just like that. So next, it'd be great to see who is in the room with us today. Um, so it'd be great if you could type your name in your institution for us. So I will start. So I'm going to say Miranda Davis, UW. So just let us know where you're joining us from today. We'll give people a couple of seconds to type their responses. Thanks, everyone. It looks like we have a couple of people also typing directly on the screen, so feel free to test that out. <laughs> oh, great. North Carolina. Great to see so many different faces in the room. And a bunch of different institutions, too. That's great. Hey, welcome, everybody. <laughs> Okay, welcome. Well, feel free to keep typing if you missed um, missed the response. Yeah, and so we also just want to get to know you a little bit in terms of where, what your role is, your current role. Um, if you could use the poll, um, so that's right on the participant panel, right above, um, right below where your picture is or your name, and um, tell us if you're a grad student, postdoc, faculty, staff, or other. So we're getting some answers coming in. Let us know if you're having trouble responding. Okay, we'll give that about 30 more seconds. Also just giving you practice from lots of different ways to interact. <laughs> but it does help us to know who our audience is. All right. Why don't you um publish it? Excellent. So um interesting. So we got a, a number of staff. Um grad students and postdocs and also faculty. We've got a good mix of everybody. Great. Thank you and again and welcome. Um, my name is Janice Pope um, and I am from, um, I work for CERTL Central, the, um, the sort of hub of the CERTL network and um, we help host events like this and I'm just going to get started by um, describing a little bit about what teaching as research is because we recognize that some of you may be fairly new to this idea. Um, and this is one of the really fundamental ideas um, 
that the CERTL network is really based on. And teaching this research, to me, the, the idea is, is really to um, develop a, a mindset, cultivate a mindset of um, bringing the kind of spirit of curiosity and inquiry that we do to our, that we bring to our research, bringing that same kind of um, curiosity and inquiry to our teaching. And so really thinking about um, when I'm, you know, when I'm going to teach something, what, what might be the best way to teach it, what might be an interesting way, different way of trying something, and what else has been done in the past that, you know, to, what, what have people published to, um, to suggest for what you might, how you might teach a certain topic. And then, of course, figuring out, well, how would I know if it even works? And then figuring out a way of actually measuring that, collecting some data and then, and then reflecting on the results. And then using that um, to, um, in my future teaching, to reflect and kind of iterate. So it's a really, um, it's taking a, um, deliberative and systematic and reflective approach to um, investigating your teaching and essentially using an inquiry cycle in the same way you might in your research. So we have this nice uh, infographic that kind of illustrates the teaching as research process. So it really is a circle, but we have it as a line here, but you can imagine the two ends connecting. So you get inspired about something that you think about and that you have encountered in the classroom or something maybe that you encountered as a student and you think could be done better. And um, you think about, well, what is my specific question about that? And then you look at what other people have published to address that. Um, you might need to obtain approval to do human subjects research, depending on your institution. And then you really define your methods and how you're going to actually measure uh, what you're looking for. You then actually, you know, collect the data in the classroom or whatever venue you're working in, you analyze your data, and then you hopefully report out to other people in some form, whether it's a poster or presentation, and then think, we really reflect on it and, and think about what you learned from the process. And then, you know, it's great if you then are able to um, even iterate and so get a chance to do it over again in um, the next time you teach. So, Again, just to see where you all are, I wanted to ask you what your experience is in is um, with teaching as research. So you can actually use the um, the drawing tool here. You could also use the text box tool if you want to put an X um, or you know make a little mark somewhere on this line where you are. And in, in, if you're working on a teaching as research project, or if you're just here to learn more, you can put a symbol there. Or if you if you mentor TAR projects, you can click over there. So please go ahead and make your mark. You can do it on the line or near the line. Awesome. Looks like we have some um, some people completing here. Some people here to learn. Good. We have a whole spectrum. So for those of you who have completed, we have a little plug to make because we have some um, teaching as research presentations coming up in April. And uh, Miranda, thank you. So she just posted in the chat window. Uh, we'd love to hear you present your um, your project at this at this event. So please think about signing up to do that. Great. So thanks for telling us a little bit about you. So um, we're going to get started by I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves um, one at a time, and then we'll get started with some with questions and discussion. So first, I'm going to ask. Kate Hayden to introduce yourself, please. So they're each going to answer the questions about when they did their TAR project, um, and how long they've been in their current position, and what a little bit about their teaching as research project, and what was the most compelling thing you learned. I should give a more general introduction, though. This is um, Dr. Kate Hayden. She's currently an assistant professor of chemistry at Bir Birmingham Southern College, and she's uh, an alumna of University of Al Alabama, Birmingham, which is where she did her TAR project. So, Kate, please introduce yourself. Thanks. Yeah, so um, I did my TAR project. It sort of spanned both my fourth and fifth year of graduate school at UAB. Um, and I've been currently teaching here at BSC. Um, this is my fourth year, so my third year tenure track. I did my first year as a visiting um, professor. Uh, when I started. Um, I kind of skipped my postdoc, so as soon as I finished at UAB, I got the visiting professor position here and then got the tenure track position. 
Uh, my teaching as research project was basically looking at um, one of the things we wanted to do is encourage more first year students to start doing research earlier in undergrad at UAB. And so we wanted to look at what were the roadblocks both from the student's perspective and the faculty's perspective. Um, the student, are they nervous or not confident to start research early? And then faculty, are they um, kind of wary of bringing on a first year student into their lab? And so the course was designed to sort of get students that head start um, into thinking about research. And so we really wanted to focus on could we improve their confidence and expose them to all of the research that was going on around campus at UAB. Um, and then I, I guess sort of the most compelling thing I learned is I sort of really tackled the project backwards. Um, and I really, uh, I did, I sort of formulated my research question and implemented the project before I sort of took the seminar on teaching as research that UAB CERTL group offered. Um, and so there was a lot of reflection during the seminar reflecting back on the project of things I could have improved on, especially um, connecting what my research question is with my evaluation methods and the assessment of what the students were doing a little bit better and a little more concrete. Great. Thank you, Kate. And yeah, Miranda has um, put a link to Kate's um, teaching as research project on the CERGO website if you want to read about it more later. Um, next, we're, I'm going to ask um, our next panelist, Jesse McClure, to introduce himself. So he's currently a postdoc in genomics biology at um, New UMass Medical School and the Broad Institute. And, um, but he's an alumnus of the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And so Jesse, if you could please introduce yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Jesse. I did my TAR project, you know, I think it was started in 2014. It was in my last two years of my uh, 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 PhD. And I had been, at the time, I had been teaching uh, a writing class, an upper division writing class within the psychology major. And we really hoped in that class to teach kind of big concepts about tone and audience and structuring an argument and having a persuasive argument. But every semester we struggle with much more basic uh, issues of students not properly using punctuation or having poor parallel construction or bad paragraph structure. And so we uh, had a bunch of worksheets that covered kind of these basic writing skills that we thought and hoped were just kind of a review to get students' minds back on those basic uh, skill sets. Uh, but every semester, students really struggled with those skills, and it was it showed it, it, we could see that also in their uh, final writing projects. Uh, so some instructors tackled this problem by having little lectures about how to use punctuation or how to use parallel construction before we give up these worksheets. But of course, the students just didn't pay any attention to those because they thought at the time that they knew this stuff. So that was old news. They didn't need to know that. Uh, then other instructors took a different approach where they gave up the worksheets, they let the students struggle with them, and then they reviewed them afterwards, after the students realized that, oh, we, we don't know this. We are struggling. But I think the problem there was that the students were kind of demoralized and just getting a horrible grade on this worksheet of very basic material. And they didn't get a chance to quickly apply what they were taught in that review session. So I tried something different. I had just been learning about uh, kind of peer learning and cooperative learning strategies. And I decided to give that a shot, where I gave them the worksheet in class. And they worked in groups. So it was open note, open style guide, open internet, whatever. They could use whatever they wanted to figure out how to answer these questions well. And I would wander around the room and kind of get a feel for what people were really struggling with. And then I could give very short little brief overviews of that whatever topic they were struggling with. And after that, they, they all answered the worksheets together, handed them in before they went home, and then they got another very small exercise on the same topic to do at home. So the end result of this is that the students were confronted with this problem. They worked together in class to solve that problem and were given the materials to do so right away. And then they were immediately able to practice. And I think those three steps worked really well for these writing writing skills, but I think it can be applied to many other scenarios where, again, it's the step one is you present a challenge, you equip them to overcome the challenge, and then you let them immediately practice that what they just learned and acquired. Uh, so it was a really good experience for me. Uh, and there was, to me, there was uh, what I kind of got out of it was the content lessons about peer learning, 
but also a kind of a process lesson because I did this iteratively over a few semesters of learning to keep data about what's working in my classroom. Uh, and so we'll probably touch back on that point throughout the, the meeting today. Great, great. Thank you, Jesse. And yeah, again, Miranda has uh, linked to Jesse's project. That's pretty cool that as a biologist you're teaching in um, writing classes. So um, our, our third panelist is Laura Slane, and she is an assistant professor of biomedical engineering at Trine University, which is in Indiana. And she's an alumna of the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And so, Laura, would you please introduce yourself? Sure, yeah, I'm really happy to be here, so thanks for the invitation. Um, I did my TAR project back in 2013, probably about the same point in my PhD as the other two. Um, and I had a little bit of a long road to get where I am now. I went off and um, did a postdoc for a little while and then ended up here trying, so I'm in my second semester. Um, at Trine, but I've really been loving it and it has been really fun to try out some of these fertile principles in the classroom. So uh, my project was focused on the flipped classroom model because that was really in at the time and uh, one of the big complaints about the flipped model was just the amount of time it takes to actually flip your classroom. And I was curious if that was true if you were a first time professor. So um, clearly it's a lot of work if you've been teaching the same thing over and over again to change it all up. But I was curious at if it was more startup time starting with a flipped model versus um, a traditional model. So I compared two different groups of people, one of whom, uh, one group worked on the traditional model, one did flipped, and looked to see the differences. Um, we did find that there was a lot more startup time in the flipped model, but also that students uh, liked it a lot more and seemed to learn a lot more. So um, that was pretty interesting. I definitely learned a lot about um, educational research and um, how to do this project. With um, to do this really well, I would definitely have to iterate and do it again because I learned a lot of mistakes along the way. Um, and I think what was most compelling was seeing the parallels between teaching and research and uh, the research that I was doing in my uh, major. So seeing how many iterations I did my normal research until I got to that publishable study um, and seeing also those links between um, trying to figure out what to measure to try and get exactly what you were interested in, what literature you needed to review in order to see what was going on, and really seeing those parallels so I could use those same critical thinking skills I had been developing as a researcher but apply it all to teaching. So that was really compelling to me and really exciting that you um, didn't need to think of teaching and research as separate things, but they really could be thought of in the same sphere and you could apply skills both ways. Great, that's great to hear. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, I mean, I think teaching as research really is about breaking down that, that kind of artificial boundary between our teaching and our research. And um, again, ourselves as well-rounded scholars that are doing both and approaching both in the same way. So thank you all. So now we're going to get into the um, the actual questions and discussion. So I have some questions um, that we've we've sort of dis uh, determined in advance that were um, suggested in advance that we're going to ask first. But on each one of the slides, there is some white space. So you're welcome to write um, follow-up questions or comments directly on the slides, um, and then we can address those before we move on to the next question. And then we'll there also just be open question time after we get through, the, through these um, few questions that we have kind of set in advance. So, uh, and um, we're not going to have each of the panelists answer all of the questions. They're, they're going to, um, one or two of them are going to answer each question. Um, so we're going to start with this question. Um, and Jesse volunteered to um, kind of try to tackle this. So how would you describe the value of doing a teaching as research project? Uh, I think the Great luck. I'll, I'll give a little background first. When I did my TAR project, which I just talked about, I was working very closely with a, a, a mentoring, a group of instructors and a, and a faculty member who was mentoring the instructors all about, we basically had these little seminars on teaching and, and, well, yeah, on teaching and how to do it well. And a lot of the advice you get on how to teach well or how to, you know, how to deal with various problems in a classroom is kind of anecdotal or based on somebody's intuition or just something that may have worked for them. And I think those experiences are extremely valuable. We shouldn't, we shouldn't devalue that intuition, but we also need to take time to collect data on it and say, is what we believe working, is it actually working? And is it working for the students? It's easy to, to go in front of a classroom and 
try a new technique and come out of there thinking, that felt like it worked really well. Or to say that, you know, the students really enjoyed it. But neither of those necessarily mean that the students learned what you want them to learn. So by collecting the data more as kind of the, the concrete uh, objective data metrics on it allows us to see if what we're doing is actually working. Uh, right. There's a question on the screen too that I could address. Uh, as a postdoc, do you get the chance to do a talk? Uh, I think you, uh, you definitely can. Anytime you're teaching, you can do a talk. I did mine as a graduate student. Right now as a postdoc, I'm uh, in a very research-focused postdoctoral, postdoctoral position. So I've created some opportunities to teach, but it's not a major part of my job here. So that is something you'd work out with your PI or your supervisor to figure out where you're investing your time. Laura, it sounds like you've got something you'd like to add. Yeah, I think Jesse brought up a really good point. I just wanted to build on it. The idea of being in the classroom and seeing what things the students like, being different than whether or not they learned something. And I think that's such an important point. And I think TAR helps you discriminate between those things and really identify what your goals are. You know, are you trying to just get them excited about the content? Because there's some value in that as well. But if your goal is really to help them to understand something better, what do you mean by that and how do you measure that? I think that's a really important point. And I think it's so easy in the classroom to get distracted by if the students are like happy at the end of the day or uh, sort of struggling through something. I think it's good to know the differences. That's a great point. Kate, did you want to add anything? Yeah, actually, um, I was typing it out. But um, so for me, my department actually recognizes teaching as research um, as part of my scholarship guidelines. So all the publications um, that I submit or studies that I do in terms of teaching as research counts towards uh, my tenure. Um, so in terms of um, the value of doing TAR, it allows me to both weave what I really have a passion for as well as help me um, establish tenure here at BSC. That's great. That's a very practical right value as well as um, and yeah. So those are all great points. I think the idea of um, it's not that of course we don't want our students to enjoy their time in the classroom, but we're just recognizing that you know that is something you know one goal might be to get them excited, like Laura said, but the other you know goal presumably we all also want to, them to learn something. That's great. So um, I'm going to move to the next question, which actually I think has been addressed a little bit already. Um, and we're going to start with Laura. I actually, these are all related questions. You don't have to answer all three of them. But um, did your experience with doing a teaching as research project impact your career plans? Um, how did your TAR project prepare you for your current job? And or how has TAR impacted your teaching or work in the classroom? So Laura, go ahead. Right, yeah, just building on what I just said, it certainly makes me approach what I am, my goals are each classroom, or each class period a little bit differently because I'm really thinking about what my goals are that I'm trying to achieve and how to measure that in the end. And um, I'm only in my second semester, like I mentioned, so I haven't done any formal TAR projects in my class, but I'm certainly approaching it with that sort of mindset that I don't think I had before doing a TAR project. So before spending the time to flesh out those differences, um, you know, learning objectives and what it really means to measure those learning objectives, when I put it in the context of a research study where I was trying to evaluate different things, it really helped me focus in on what my goals were, which is something that I use in um, the classroom all the time. That's great. Um, and I, and the, um, our hope is certainly that the project, the process of doing a teaching and research project does really kind of, um, you know, help establish these great habits so that you're, you know, you're using them all the time in your future teaching. So yeah, Kate, what would you like to say about this? So I would say the Teaching as Research project directly informed my career plans. Um, as I was finishing my Teaching as Research project and finishing my PhD, I was starting to apply at different positions. Um, and I had you know, offers for like three different postdocs, um, the Department of Forensic Science here in Alabama. Um, a industrial postdoc if I wanted to go industry, and then I got the, the offer for the um, position here at BSC, and I knew BSC um, embraced teaching as research. Um, there was a lot of focus on that. I already knew that that was something that was important um, at this institution, so it was because of that that I decided to go to BSC. It was actually the lowest offer um, and the riskiest offer that I had, but um, 
because of my experience with CERTAL and because I knew this was a passion that I wanted to focus, if not the majority of my research, at least 50% of my research time on teaching is research, that BSc is where I wanted to go. Um, going through the project mentored at UAB helped inform my projects that I have going on here at BSC. So we just got a review back from our paper that we submitted on looking, uh, Laura, at flipped classrooms um, and how they impact critical thinking. So I'm really excited about the comments we got back and hopefully that study will be published soon. Um, and like I said, it's just, it's so integrated here um, that I really, um, and constantly reflecting on my courses. I actually blog about it um, every semester on all of my courses to think about how I can improve the class, not just them mastering content, but then mastering all of those other um, skills that they need for success in career. And teaching as research helps me do that. And it's also great that you have, that you're doing, you're reflecting in a public way like that with a blog. That's really a nice way of kind of um, making that reflection piece really um, you know, make sure it's serious and um, even accountable. So can I ask you a follow-up question briefly? Do you have undergraduate students involved in your teaching as research projects? You know, presumably not in the same class, but you have, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're doing research with you and they're collaborating with you on this project? I actually do. Um, I had one student help me with our critical thinking in the flipped classroom study. Um, he was my teaching fellow and he got it. Um, we have what's called our Vail Fellowships. Um, for teaching fellows where they can get paid an additional stipend or get a, a course credit for doing um, sort of what's a teaching assistantship but elevated so they're doing some sort of research on the classroom or learning about different pedagogies on top of um, teaching. And then we also have education majors that I'll try to um, get them in. I have a project that just got funded um, that I'm starting up this summer. Um, and, and hoping to reach out to some of the education majors for them to help me with this project. No, oh, that's really cool. Great. So, Jesse, um, I think you were going to maybe talk about this the last, uh, third question on here, or any other questions. Uh, yes. So, the, so I second everything I just heard, but I, I would add two things to that. One I just thought of, but the one that I knew of before is that it, it's really changed uh, how I kind of, or it made me collect data in my classrooms beyond the data I need to give students a grade or to assign grade. I really am kind of assigning myself a grade in the classroom as I collect the data on what's working and what's not. And that's a lot easier said than done. And how do you, how do you get that data and how do you evaluate the what's working and what's not? So that's something I'm always thinking about now. I also, something that came to my mind in hearing the, the previous answers to this is that I'm now on the job hunt and I'm really looking for a teaching position. And I realize only now in hindsight that being involved in CERTL and the TAR project has made me aware of the teaching literature and for better or for worse, the teaching jargon, the terms that are used. So now when I look at these uh, positions that I might be applying to, I can, I can understand what some of them are talking about and I can know how much they value teaching or how, what aspects of teaching they value. Or if they don't mention anything related to this, that might be a red flag that maybe this isn't a teaching teaching focused position that I might want to look elsewhere. That's interesting. So it's helping you both um, and maybe express, uh, you know, your own um, expertise, but then also help you recognize which institutions might be a good fit for you. So yeah, somebody had posted a follow-up question. What, what are your experiences like juggling teaching and research projects with your basic science research? Our panel is trying to do both in their careers now or just focusing on one for the time being. So yeah, Kate, it looks like you had um, you had addressed that. Do you want to um, address it verbally as well? I think you're coming. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it, I started typing it and then it um, got long. But so I, I juggle both. Um, most of my um, summer research, like my wet lab research exists in the summer. We have a really good summer STEM program um, where we can stipend students and provide housing. Um, and then in the fall with our senior capstone. So I, I'm from a primary undergrad institution. Um, so I think my scholarship expectations might be lower um, than other participants here at more R01 institutions. Um, so that does allow me to spend more time, I think, on teaching as research um, than in terms of wet lab research. 
Um, and we also, all we have are undergrads. We don't have graduate students at our institution. Yeah, I would say for me it's it's struggling, but it's the same thing as it was in graduate school. So it's just, you know, doing things as there's time. I'm also at a primary undergraduate institution, but I'm still keeping up with some research um, in my primary major. And like I said, I'm hoping to do some more formal TAR in the near future. Um, but that's just a matter of, I think, juggling both different things to see which one um, you can work on at what time sort of thing. I think uh big difference between just teaching and doing teaching as research is that you're just collecting data on what you're already doing. Uh, and so balancing a TAR project with other research is certainly going to be challenging. But balancing teaching with research is always going to be challenging. And if we're, if we're already putting the time into teaching well, we might as well collect data on it. I don't think that adds much beyond just taking the time to teach well. I think the only thing I'd say is a little bit different is with the teaching as research, I think you're a little bit tied to the schedule. So that's where I've had trouble um, getting started because I have an idea in mind, but now I want to do it when I have, um, at, at the beginning of the semester I want to start it, so I have to wait again for that cycle to come around. That's the only difference um, for mm -hmm. the kind of thing I'm thinking of doing. Yeah, I have some challenges in that, and that, you know, I only teach sort of my um, specific course, Biochem, once a year. Um, so, and I only do one section. So the advantage of a PUI is that you kind of have an environment that really encourages focusing on teaching as research, but your, you know, your end's real low. Um, if you're trying to get statistically relevant data and have a good control, can be really challenging there. That's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. Um, so, do you um, have you tried collaborating with with folks that? you know, at UAB or any other in larger institutions? Uh, would it work, do you think? Um, there's definitely some different environments there. The project that I just got funded um, through the Associated Colleges of the South is a collaborative project between us and Rhodes and other ACS institutions. Um, so by collaborating with Rhodes has expanded um, our project capabilities like tenfold. Um, so I'm really excited about how this project will go this fall. Oh, that's cool. So you're you're doing it in a similar environment of a um, primary undergraduate in institution, but you can increase your end. That makes a lot of sense. Yes. Cool. So I'm going to um, actually just ask a uh, pause to let the audience ask any more questions if they'd like on this before we move on to another question. The next question is fairly related because it's asking, um, for the two panelists who are in um, currently assistant professor positions, how they discuss their TAR project and their CV and teaching statement and cover letters and how you talk about it in interviews. So it looks like, Kate, you're up first for this one. Yeah, sure. So yeah, it was um, the project and the course that the project was centered around was directly described in my um, CV. Um, my teaching statement, I was able to sort of support um, the foundations of my teaching statement by the project, um, able to referencing to it. Um, and then I definitely mentioned it in my cover letter as well. Um, in my interviews, um, CERTL and the project was kind of front and center, again, because I was applying at an institution that um, found value in that. Um, other positions that I interviewed for that were more um, research postdoc or the forensics position, I brought it up in terms of my ability to um, manage a project and then also in terms of teaching my ability to manage people, um, help teach people how to, you know, work in the lab and be a supervisor. So I was able to find a way to weave it in even if it wasn't directly related to teaching. Oh, that's nice. So you use yeah, yeah, um, transferable skills. That's great. So um, it looks like somebody's typing another question, but before um, we address that, Laura, do you want to also talk about how you use your TAR project? Yeah, I, I'd, agree, I'd agree pretty clearly with that, Kate. I think a lot of the skills you use, you can um, use in any setting to show that you can go beyond just your research major. I think even that is pretty compelling. Um, you know, if you're really good at one very, very specific thing, that can be limiting. So showing that you can do research and experiment in a completely different field, I think, is pretty compelling. And then when it came to applying for teaching positions, it was front and center. Um, not only because of what I learned, but I also think it shows a huge dedication to this career path that you are willing to put in the time on that type of project. And I do think I learned so much um, from the practical nature. I think 
um, talking about these things in theory is so different than actually trying it out and collecting real data. So having gone through that experience, I learned a lot. Um, I used it a lot for my teaching philosophy to talk about how my research informed my teaching philosophy and how part of my philosophy was the idea, just like Jesse has been saying, of using real data to reflect back on what I've done. Um, and it sort of ties into the question on the um, on the board. I think one of the key things I learned from my time in CERTL, not just for the TAR project, but in general, was the idea that it's all a big experiment and that's okay. So it's okay to try stuff in the classroom, and if it doesn't go well, that's okay too. Some things are going to work great, some don't. Some you see that there's things you need to improve on, and you pay attention to that. But I think it's all about experimenting, which also ties back into teaching and research. So not just trying new stuff, but then reflecting on whether or not they accomplish what you were trying to. And I think that was a really big, uh, it was really freeing to know that not every class has to be a slam dunk for it still to be a success. Um, and so some of the things I've seen before, some were things I've just been trying, and so I think it's all a big experiment trying out how things go. That's a great um, attitude to have, yeah, just remembering that, yeah, it's not always going to go well, but that's totally okay because you're trying, yeah, it's just a big experiment. So, um, well, and your normal research doesn't either, right? I mean, we do right. pilot testing all the time. Right. Um, it's a little bit more awkward when you're crashing and burning in front of students, but that doesn't happen very often. So you just have to have a good attitude, I think. Right, right. Um, and so, um, Kate or Jesse, do you also want to um, address, so this is an interesting question about um, if, um, if, you were, if you tried things that you hadn't experienced when you were a student, and so what was that like if you, you know, tried flipping your classroom or doing active learning that you ha actually hadn't experienced yourself as a student. I can briefly comment on that, but first to follow up on, on, on what Laura was just saying, I think students are more forgiving than funding agencies and, and reviewers of journals. Uh, so we're in good shape there. Uh, but for the, sorry, the question on um, there. On Jesse, sorry, can you turn up your mic a little bit? Try that. Me? It's a little quiet. It's getting better. Okay, uh, so I was trying things with kind of cooperative learning, a little bit of a flipped classroom approach that I hadn't seen as a student, uh, but I'd seen it demonstrated through uh, other CERTL lessons, CERTL, CERTL uh, programs, and I've actually, I've often had a kind of a, I'm very skeptical, and I was very cynical and skeptical about the flipped classroom idea, especially when I heard some people present it. But when I hear Eric Mauser talk about it, he's got lots of videos on YouTube and on CERTL programs. When he talks about it, it makes sense. And he, I think, to me, he is a huge inspiration on how to do that correctly. And seeing how he talks about doing it and how uh, seeing some examples of him using it in the classroom were the examples I needed. I just wanted to follow up on that, too. The other big thing I took away from my TAR project was seeing people who were forced to do a flipped classroom and their different responses to it. And I think part of the takeaway message I got was that you need to stay within you and do what you're comfortable with and that um, completely flipping your classroom might not be the right move for you and that's okay. And I think it's a lot about trying these new strategies and also, you know, pushing yourself but not doing something just because you read online is the better way to do it. I think you have to do something that falls within what you're comfortable with. And so it doesn't have to be flipped. It might be that you're just trying to be a little bit more active in the classroom or do a little bit more cooperative learning. And that way you can try out these different things without necessarily standing up on day one and saying this entire class will be flipped. That's a good point. Yeah, I mean, you, um, doing things that really work for you and fit with your personality, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, Kate, did you have anything to add, add to? I think you actually did, a, you already addressed this question, didn't you? Well, I mean, I was just going to say, um, I think, you know, all of these types of learning, I, I, would, I would challenge that most of us have seen this as students, maybe not in the sciences, but definitely in the humanities. I mean, ancient Greeks have been doing discussions and flip teaching, um, you know, forever. And so it's, I think it's just novel for us to think about it in terms of STEM. Um, and I would say when I started at BSC, I had the choice of either continuing the biochem course sort of as a traditional or I was one of those people like Laura said that was able to start out flipping um, 
and it was challenging, um, and it's still an iterative process of continually t trying to improve it and get it, get the formula right. Um, but I've definitely been very happy you were trained in ancient Greece. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it's been a really fun process, for sure. Great. Thanks. But that, that is a really good point. I think we forget that um, we experience these kind of things in um, humanities classrooms all the time, and we just don't recognize it. as They don't call it flipping the classroom. <laughs> they just call it you know, teaching English. Um, Okay, so we're going to move on to the next question, um, sort of more specifically focused on how to do a TAR project. And um, we're going to start with Jesse. What do you think is the appropriate size and scale for a teaching and research project? I'd say about 48 to 36 inches makes a good poster presentation. Uh, beyond that, I don't think there are any guidelines for the size and, and scope. Uh, but that might be because I'm biased by how I started my TAR project. I think uh, it was mentioned by uh, one of the other panelists earlier that came into this a little differently. I think everybody might come into a TAR a little differently than the normal diagrams of how it works. Uh, but I was just teaching a class. Uh, I saw something that didn't work well. I thought I might be able to come up with something better. And so I tried it, and it seemed to work really well. And only after that did I start actually, it wasn't until a, a teaching mentor pointed out that I could, should start thinking about it as a TAR project. And then I, Coincidentally, I was supervising and instruct six sections of that same class the next semester. So I was able to try it with kind of the, the experimental and control group. Not a huge sample size, but as an animal behaviorist, I'm used to small sample sizes. So we were able to have classes trying it and classes doing the more quote unquote traditional way. Uh, and then I got the data from the outcomes of that and then I reapplied it in the following semester. I think this is what CERTL calls the full inquiry cycle, where I was getting that feedback and adjusting. And I think any time you can do that, that is the right size and scope. Any time you can collect data, interpret it, and change your practices and teaching based on that interpretation. That's a good way of thinking about it. Um, so, Laura, did you have also suggestions about this? Yeah, I think that was a really good point you brought up, Jesse. And I was going to say that after I did my TAR project, I was able to stay involved on my campus and help some other people through their TAR projects. And one of the things that I noticed was pretty consistent that I did as well was that we tended to think really, really big. Um, and again, if you bring up the metaphor for your normal uh, research, you know, that you're doing in your dissertation, that you really need to do a lot of iterations and a lot of preliminary work to get there, and your final thing you present in your PhD is probably not the same experiment you did your first try, and that's okay. So I think like Jesse's point is anything you can learn from is taking a step in the right direction, and that it's okay to sort of step back from your big plans and the first time start with something a little smaller, sort of get your feet wet so you can improve the process the next round. Kate, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I would say the, the really hardest thing to do is to formulate a testable research question. Um, so spending a good amount of time, uh, oh, my, okay, good, my computer just went to sleep. Um, spending a good amount of time of um, thinking about that question, talking to people about that question, um, narrowing the question down enough, and then finding the appropriate way to measure it, and then you know having a couple terms to implement it and collect that data um, is probably the best way. But you know, just like everything else in science, we don't work in a in an isolated bubble, so getting with other people and talking to them about it, um, letting them help you um, kind of formulate this whole project is, is probably one of the most helpful things to figure out what is your appropriate size and scale. Yeah, it's very true that um, someone else looking at it can actually probably have a, um, a more um, unbiased view and say, oh, it looks like you're trying, you're tackling too much, and, and are you really uh, measuring what you, what you say you want to measure? Um, that's always very helpful. Um, does anyone else, anyone from the audience have a, any follow-up questions to this before we move on to the next question? And um, after the next question, we're going to just open it up for any questions from the audience. So um, the next question, I think, Kate, you might have actually just kind of um, alluded to this a little bit in what you were just saying, what the most challenging step in your TAR project was, your first TAR project, and how you overcame it. 
Yeah, I mean, definitely the most challenging part for me was, um, you know, formulating a good, measurable, narrow question, and then figuring out the best way to measure the results that um, that you get from asking that question or the methods that you employ. Um, and really, this is one of the hardest things for me, and this is also based on the feedback um, that I just got from the reviewers on the manuscript we submitted. Um, is sometimes it's really hard to have a real control. Um, you know, you could argue pre and post measurements, but then is it your intervention that changed the pre and post? Is it was you just had a really good lecture that day? Um, or was it really the activity? Um, you could try to have a control where it's a, someone else teaching the classroom. But then it's, is that a person measurement, you know, different instructors? Um, you could try, you know, a completely different institution, but now you have all these other factors. Even if it's the same section uh, or the same class, but two different sections that you teach, well, now you may have a class that's predominantly athletes versus one that's not. I mean, really thinking about the controls and the appropriate controls, especially in uh, educational research, is, is probably one of the most challenging things and the, one of the easiest things you'll get. Um, uh, feedback from from your reviewers. So. That's, that's really interesting. I was writing a reflection on it, which I will continue to do while Jesse um, um, responds to this question also. Yeah, it, I agree with all that, that it's hard to have good controls uh, for two reasons. One is the actual practical nature of you know, noisy data. You have different instructors, different classrooms, all these confounding variables. But do any of us live? Do any of us live in a world where our normal science doesn't have confounding variables? We just learn to to how to either statistically deal with that or to uh, how, how to have the right controls for that, and we just need to apply that thinking to our teaching. Uh, I even just kind of thought of a smart comment is that you know if you think something's going to work, is it appropriate to keep a control group where you don't do it the way you think it's going to work? But that is still not unique to teaching and medical research. If we think a treatment can help patients, how do we evaluate that? How do we have the control group? And there are ways to do that, and I'm not going to claim to be an expert on it, but I don't think it's all that different from our normal science. But actually, my original answer to this, uh, what, was, what was the most challenging part, is publishing it, because I'm still thinking about that and haven't gotten there yet. And you still clearly learned a lot from the process, but you, you want to kind of take it that little step further. Um, yeah, I was trying to finish my thought in the what I was typing. Um, for those of us who don't do any medical research or um, research with humans, um, thinking about working with humans and the idea of how you would even have a control in that case is, is really a new way of thinking. So um, we just need to, um, yeah, I, I think actually reading the educational literature, you can really learn to understand a little better how, um, how they approach things to sort of learn what they can and can't say. If you don't have a control, then, you know, what kind of claims can you make? Um, so there's lots of different ways to approach it, but it's a very different kind of way of thinking. Um, Warren, did you have anything to add to this? I think those are really good points that uh, Jesse is making. And again, I think it's uh, what your goal is. If you're trying to publish it, obviously you need to do more in terms of the control. But you think about the experiments you do in science class in high school, and you're still learning something from doing an experiment and collecting data. Maybe not at a publishable level, but clearly having data is better than not. So I also don't want to sort of overstate all of the issues with it, especially if you're um, seeking it out for the first time. But you can definitely learn a lot that first round of doing a teaching as research project. And I think part of the goal the first time around is just knowing those limitations so that you know that one limitation is you don't have a control group or it's not as good. And then as you iterate and you get to the stage that Kate is at where you're trying to publish, then you have to do a much better job, of course, of controlling those sorts of things. But I still think you can learn from even a less controlled study. Cool. Thank you. So we are now actually going to just um, move on to open up for any sort of questions you in the audience might want to ask. And again, there's a couple ways of doing that. Um, you can raise your hand, and if you're um, if you're if you have audio that works, and you can ask the question over your mic, and you can also even turn on your camera. Um, you can also write directly onto the slide using that text box tool. 
Um, and uh, we're open to any questions now. That looks like there's a question specifically for Kate. Interesting question. So how mm -hmm. has the process changed from when you did it the first time versus now that you're doing it as more of a professional activity? That's a really good question. Um, so definitely the first time I did it, I definitely stumbled into it, thought I had a good question, kind of played around with some methods, got my results, realized my results really didn't align with my question because it really wasn't the question I wanted. So now I really spend a lot more time in the planning. Um, I might spend a whole semester talking to colleagues and um, trying to really think about what it is we want to measure, what is the problem, what would we like to fix, um, and then thinking about the best way to do that. And then usually at the same time, I'm writing a grant so I can get some funding to do it. Um, so it kind of works out that way. But definitely taking my time in the beginning to really think about the project and how I want to structure it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it, it, but as your for your first try, it makes a lot of sense that you, you know, d didn't have time to do that. But now that you know a lot more, you can really um, step back and and design the project really thoroughly. So um, there was a, another question here about whether you did your TAR project in a cohort group. So um, yeah, were you meeting with others who were doing projects at the same time? And if so, did that help the pro process? Do one of you like to address that? I can give that a shot. Uh, so my answer is yes and no. Uh, so in my graduate program, I was very active with our uh, our local CERTL, which was just getting off the ground. Uh, but I was also teaching this course, which was essentially a mentored teaching experience. So we, the graduate students each taught a section of the course, and we met weekly for basically our teaching course uh, that we compared notes on how we were teaching the class and what went wrong, what worked well. And I think that cohort group was extremely valuable. But it wasn't specifically a group to do TAR projects. Uh, in fact, uh, I don't think any of the other instructors did TAR projects, and at least until after I left. Later on in my graduate career, we did have a group that met just to kind of discuss TAR projects. And I think that was useful, but to me, not as valuable. And there's a, some notes I look back on that I had here to talk about today that I kind of missed, uh, but it fits in here, that I think coming up with a, a TAR question or, you know, I, I really think TAR projects are not all that different from other research we might do as graduate students or young scientists, is that you can imagine a graduate student, some of us may have been this graduate student or we've known them, who start in the lab and say, what should I study or what experiment should I do? And I think the good answer to that question is if you're asking, you just need to go observe. You need to go out, whatever your field is, in animal behavior, you go watch animals until you see something that you want to ask about and address. And if you want to get into a TAR project, if you don't know what to ask, don't try to formulate a, uh, don't try to force a question out there. Just go into either a teaching mentor group or get teaching experience, get in front of a room full of students, and an idea will occur to you. You'll see something that could be done better, or you'll have a question about why something works the way it does, and that's where you want to start from. I also worked in a group, and I found it incredibly helpful. It was like a lab meeting, but sort of in this new area for me. And so I liked that I got ideas just hearing completely different projects, and I think I learned as much from seeing my peers go through the process as I did. So from my experience, I would definitely recommend that you find if there's a local community and some other people you can work with, just to have some people to bounce ideas with and sort of work through all this with them. Kate, um, how did it work at UAB? Did you have a cohort that were working on TAR projects at the same time? Yeah, so we did. Um, UAB had a pretty good structure in place, so um, there was a cohort of us who went all through every level of CERTL together. Um, and it was really great because during the seminar about um, formulating a te teaching as research project, granted I did the seminar after my teaching as research project, so that was a little backwards, um, but it was a great um, opportunity, again, like Laura said, to kind of learn about what other my peers were doing and hear their ideas. And I developed a lot of good friendships that have lasted. Um, one of the colleagues that went with me through the CERTL program and the TAR process is now, she was a psychology major. 
um, got her PhD in psychology, but she's actually at the Department of Chemistry at Emory, um, kind of working in their first year programs, and her work is exclusively um, teaching is research. And so we've been starting to talking about some collaborations between BSC and, and some of the projects they got ongoing at Emory now. Oh, that's really cool. I, I know that when I was a graduate student, the opportunities I had to interact with graduate students outside of my department were really valuable. It's just sometimes really helpful to um, get perspective because you can, you know, really get tunnel vision as a graduate student, or I could anyway. Um, I want to uh, um, ask this next question. What made you want to do a TAR project? And um, was the experience like what you expected? <laughs> Probably not, but yeah. Laura. Yeah, I wanted to jump in on this one because I did not want to do a TAR project, to be totally honest. I only did it because um, at my university, if you wanted to get a teaching certificate, you had to do a TAR project. And I was absolutely dreading it because it sounded really scary and intimidating and uh, like a lot of work. And uh, it was absolutely the like the strongest thing I did as a part of CERTL and as a part of teaching. And so that was so pivotal. And because of the TAR project, I got so much more involved in my local community, which was really exciting. And that opened so many doors for me. So if anyone's on the fence, I would really encourage you to do it. When I look back on the stuff I did in graduate school for around teaching, this was the pivotal thing that I did. And it made such a difference just putting those things in practice. And it sort of leads into the other question about um, did my non-TAR public students help me get my current position? I'm sure they had nothing to do with it. So that was something, you know, I went and did a postdoc after this. I was really research heavy. And uh, I had an opportunity and I went and interviewed. And, you know, they didn't care at all about my publications or my grants or anything. They wanted to know about teaching. So um, back to Jesse's point a while ago, partly just knowing the lingo and having real examples that I could give um, and having had this whole, um, this whole project that I did. And um, I didn't actually publish it, but I did um, present at a local university community. So putting that abstract on my resume, and I was able to get a grant to go to a teaching conference because of having this experience. So in so many ways, I think it really set me apart from other people um, and helped me get into the sphere. So I would absolutely encourage you to do it, even if it's something that sounds a little scary, it's so worth it. That's interesting. That, that, it, that was really cool to hear that actually is your, um, well, maybe disheartening, but um, cool from the perspective of promoting teaching as research that that, that that actually mattered a lot more than your your actual sort of disciplinary publication. So, um, Kate, um, I want to, since we, we are addressing this question now, what do you think about, um, what's your response to that question about how much did your, your um, disciplinary research help you get your current, current position? Um, I mean, it, I, I definitely say, you know, we're a teaching-focused institution, but we also believe research is a teaching tool. Um, and so I also have a paper, um, a wet lab research paper coming out with two students um, that are co-authors on that project um, that we just submitted um, to breast cancer research and treatment. So we're really excited about that publication. Um, so while I don't want to downplay, um, the wet lab research and the actual research that I do beyond teaching is research. Um, it is important to us because to us we see it as a tool for teaching. Um, and so that informs our students. All of our students have to do an authentic research project in order to graduate as their capstone. Um, and so it was just as important for us to have projects that students could do. Um, in terms of wet lab research. And we have a lot of students go on to grad school, so it gives them a really good um, advantage um, in applying for graduate school as well. So that's interesting. So it, it, it's specifically um, research that is kind of um, doable in that setting and with undergraduates. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're not R01. We're not getting big grants. So it's, it's definitely something that our departmental budget can fund. Um, and also things that, you know, the expectations is that we're not publishing five papers a year, but maybe, you know, three, three to four papers within the 10-year process. So um, I um, want to just see if we want to go back to this question, um, either Jesse or Kate about what made you want to do the project, because it was, we heard from Laura, which is really interesting, that she actually didn't want to do it, but she's so glad she did. Um, 
Yeah, Jesse, it sounds to me like from what you described, you kind of were doing something anyway, and then someone convinced you that it could be turned into a tire project. Is that right? Yeah, I blame Beth. Beth Jacob. <laughs> so, uh, so she was my uh, teaching mentor uh, at UMass Amherst, and I was just getting into all the servile stuff and learning what it was all about, and I'd already been doing this, or I'd already started this intervention in my own classroom. Uh, and she was only pointing out that that sounds like it should be a power project. And I said, what's a power project? And so that's where that came from. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so let's see. Um, so Jesse, it looks like you started addressing this. Yeah, that's true. Good point, Kate. Um, so the term teaching as research is really um, kind of a sterile specific term, but it really does overlap with um, a term that other folks use as well, scholarship of teaching and learning. And um, so if folks don't know what you're talking to and they don't know what teaching as research is, you can tr also try telling them scholarship of teaching and learning. Um, there's also discipline-based uh, education research, um, deeper. Uh, Jesse likes to make puns, apparently. So um, um, just to get back to this question about did you need to do an IRB review for your project and how did it go? I saw that Jesse had addressed that earlier. Do either of the other two, um, did you, either of you have to? Um, sure. Yeah, so I, um, with my teaching is research project, we actually, we were in the process of um, going through IRB or getting ready for IRB review, although we believed it was a exempt, um, we still had to get the IRB to tell us if we were exempt or not, so we had to kind of apply for that. Um, but because of the course fell under an existing IRB, um, we were able to slide in under that existing IRB with approval from the current PI. Um, so that was helpful for me as a grad student. But at BSC, um, all of my projects have applied for IRB, and I actually serve on the IRB committee. It's Depending on your institution, it's usually super easy. I would probably argue most of our projects are IRB exempt, but again, you have to apply for that from the IRB. Um, and then usually it's the timing. Like UAB, sometimes it could have taken six months to get um, feedback back from the committee. Um, at BSC, it takes a week. So it sometimes it really just depends on your institution. Yeah, I uh, went to IRB as well. Um, my normal research is in human subjects, so relative to medical research, it was a breeze doing human subjects in uh, education. Um, but I think that's an example of something that would be great to do as you have the support, because I think that is another thing that can be a little bit intimidating. So if you're on a university campus and you have a community and you have the chance to go through IRB, I would definitely recommend it, just so that you can see that it's not um, this big scary thing is just answering some questions and so that when you go off to your own institution, that's not a roadblock for you. That is definitely true. I know from my experience, the first few times I dealt with IRB, it was is confusing and overwhelming, but it got a lot easier once. Again, there's like lingo there as well. Um, I did put in the chat window because I realized that we might have been throwing around that word that some people might not, not even know the acronym that means Institutional Review Board. Which is, in itself doesn't even necessarily tell you what it is, but it's, it's the committee on each campus that oversees human subjects research. And in many cases, or most cases, um, research done in the classroom is considered exempt from review, but they still maybe want to um, check it over and um, so you really want to check with your individual institution. Um, any other comments to that? We can um, ask this last question. So. I'm sure all of your projects kind of evolved from where they started to where they ended up. So, how how um how would you describe that evolution and how different was it from your original idea? Um. Well, I mean, I would say that I definitely think my final project was slightly different from my original idea only because I think my original research question was a little too broad um, and so we ended up kind of clarifying the question in terms of did active learning implementation within this course help build students confidence in um, 
research, um, starting research earlier as um, first year students or second year students. Um, ideally, it would have been great to follow these students, um, this cohort of students, all the way through to graduation um, with a control group to see, you know, did they start earlier, um, were they more successful in however objective way we wanted to measure that. Um, or not, or, or you know, repeat it a few times and, and really fine tune it. I just didn't have that opportunity since I, I kind of graduated right after I finished the teaching as research project. Cool. What about mine, mine ended up being pretty similar, um, but I had kind of a cool opportunity. Instead of doing mine in a normal undergraduate class, I actually did my TAR project in a third class. So it was a local third old class on um, teaching. I think it was called Teaching in the College Classroom. And so um, I was with a community of people that were really invested in um, the third old idea and TART. So I was able to work with the professors teaching that class to develop my project and sort of do it from the outset. So I had a lot of flexibility. So my project probably ended up being pretty similar to what I had planned. Other than that I became very clear that my end was tiny and that it wasn't really that realistic and it could be so much better. So um, I definitely think there would be value in repeating it and iterating some more. Uh, but I was sort of in a similar situation as Kate. So um, I still learned a lot from it, but it wasn't as good as it could have been, I think. I learned ways I could have improved it. Jesse, it sounds like you were able to iterate um, at least twice, right? Yeah, uh, mine changed a bit, not so much in the intervention of what we're doing, but what I uh, emphasized and what I focused on is what worked or why it worked. Uh, and when I first started and I saw, I saw the problem, my first thought of what I thought would, might help was basically the, the stereotypical flipped classroom approach. And that's actually what my project started as. I was going to do a flipped classroom approach to this. And that kind of helped. But I realized the most valuable part of that was this kind of cooperative learning, the peer learning, this in-class discussion between the students as they struggled with the problem. So as I went through the iterations, that became the focus, which, and they're, they're not, they're basically the same thing, but the focus for the, that work in this class was as that peer learning, cooperative learning, interactive in-class part. Cool. Yeah, so, um, there was a question in the chat about, um, about um, seeing papers published. I don't think that any of these three panelists published papers on their original TAR project, so, but we do have the, the link to, um, they're connected to the, the event page for each one of their projects, so Kate and Jesse both have posters there. Um, and um, they were also posted in the, in the link above. Um, yeah, and, and um, there's also a, a teacher's research um, resource collection on the, um, on the website now, um, which has more examples of teaching as research projects. There's um, a couple of compilations of projects from Cornell University and also from University of Colorado. And um, I can try to put in a link about that. Um, yeah, so it looks like we've got a couple more questions. Excellent. Um, I see many instructors in chemistry, physics, and biology who got it. Yeah, okay, sorry, they're still typing. I'll give us a second to. Uh, to finish typing, and I'll, meanwhile, I'll go find that link. Oh, yeah, okay, there is um, the CERTL forum happens every three to four years, so I think there's going to be one in early 2019, and so that's a place where um, different CERTL students can actually um, present TAR posters, so both Jesse and Kate did that at the last CERTL forum. Um, there are also often um, um, education sessions at um, at your disciplinary um, conferences, or even there might be specific disciplinary um, conferences on education research in your discipline. So for biology, for instance, it's um, the Society for the Advancement of Biology Education Research, or SABER. So I'm going to look at this question now. I see many instructors in chemistry, physics, and biology who value scientific teaching and active learning. You see the same thing in engineering. That sounds like a question for you, Laura. Uh, I think so. I think, again, it has to be a little bit natural. So I think forcing things doesn't make sense. But certainly, I personally think active learning makes such a difference. So for example, in the class I taught last semester, um, I spent a lot of time having students in groups doing problems on boards. 
So that might not be the same as having a group discussion, for example, but that worked really well. It got the students really engaged, and they seem to really like it because students like to be up and doing stuff. So, um, you know, and I think the faculty see that the students are learning and they're active, and so they respect that. But certainly there's some faculty that prefer to stand and lecture, um, but I think it's okay to sort of be who you are. I couldn't do that, so that's not how I teach. Just to add, I think if that's something that really is important to you, that that's something you look for in your interview, right? I mean, when you're interviewing, it's not just about them liking you, it's also about you liking them and seeing if you can fit in and be like the teacher that you want to be at that, in that um, setting. So if they respect that kind of thing and they respond well to it, then that might be something that's important to you. That is a really good point. Um, and I was uh, also <laughs> adding something and I realized I was muted. Um, so um, I was going to say that there is, um, some history of uh, discipline-based education, education research and how it sort of started in different disciplines and it really started in physics. I think in the 70s when physicists realized that, um, that students were graduating with um, like from prestigious institutions like Harvard and they still didn't understand what they thought were very basic concepts in physics. So that really got them thinking like, okay, what are we doing because we're not teaching what we thought we were teaching. And then it slowly moved into, I think, chemistry and then biology. Um, but I do think it, it is permeating um, l all of the STEM disciplines now, and that, that's also really what um, CERTL is about, is to really promote that. And I just want to also second what Laura said, that um, you, um, it, it can be really uncomfortable if you're in, at an institution and you're trying um, new evidence-based teaching methods and no one else is around you and they don't necessarily approve of it. So um, if you can, when you're looking at um, potential jobs, if you can sort of feel out whether that is a place where that kind of approach would be welcome. So, and we have another question. How do you find the outcome measures or like assessments for what you wish to measure? Um, what kind of measures did you use? This is a good question. Yeah, so maybe each one of you could address this question. Mm -hmm. I'll jump in on that. Uh, I, this is probably where to kind of go back to the earlier question, this is where it would be really valuable to start with a very small, clearly defined project because this question is what will bite you in the backside. I was actually really lucky that my uh, project was very small and we had some kind of built-in metrics for this. Uh, so each semester in this writing class, there were these worksheets that I mentioned were for the, the, the skills on these worksheets were the target of my intervention uh, and we had the grades on those worksheets. Now that's one outcome measure, but I didn't see it as a particularly great outcome measure because it's too uh, short term. You know, the, we ha have some intervention that helps them with the skill, of course they're going to do better on that skill that day. But we also have the four major papers throughout the semester, and we have a very clear rubric for those papers that these writing skills are, are quantified in each of their major papers. And so I had uh, six sessions, actually I think seven sessions of this class, each with about 30 students from before we, when we were doing it the old way, and I could look at the, the distribution of scores on these uh, writing skills as they happened in the students' actual papers, and then I had six sections that were, when we were doing it the new way, where I could look at that same measure, uh, and then in between there we had three sections of each, which were done in the same semester, so they were much more side by side. And so to me, those were really useful measures, uh, and I think I kind of got lucky with that, that those were built in. But if your outcome measures aren't built in, you have to find a way of getting decent uh, measures that are not just immediate when the, the intervention takes place, but actually measure some sort of longer term outcome. All right. Um, Kate or Laura, do you want to talk about what you measure? Um, so in my teaching is research project, um, we measured, um, we did student interviews, so a different faculty member that the students, um, that wasn't a teacher in the class. Um, we had some basic questions that we interviewed them on, and we also did a student's perception survey pre and post to sort of align their perceptions of how they felt their confidence in research and their skills. Um, and that was helpful. Um, my most recent project where I was looking at critical thinking gains as a result of active learning in the classroom, 
Um, I use what's called the CAT test. It's the critical thinking assessment test that was developed by Tennessee Tech. Um, which was nice about this test is it had been validated um, and it was non-discipline specific. Um, it has been used at a number of different type of institutions from R01 institutions to two-year colleges to PUIs. Um, and a number of different, they were looking at, you know, programs as well as courses. Um, and so that was nice. And then we also aligned it to um, student perceptions using the SAUG, um, student assessment of learning, or student alignment of learning games um, survey with a Likert scale questions um, pre and post. And then um, the project I have coming up, we're going to use the student assessment of learning games as well survey as well as um, looking at retention. So we're trying to see does um, seeing diverse faculty within a video series for first year, chem first year chemistry students help promote um, retention for underrepresented minorities in, uh, in chemistry and biology. I don't know, that was a lot of specific. That was helpful. Um, could you, so I actually put a link for Sal, because I'm familiar with that one, but the um, other ones you mentioned, would you be able to write those into the chat window? And um, Laura, did you want to talk about what you used for your measures? Yeah, I did a lot of stuff. I asked, because um, like I said, I had a lot of flexibility in the project. So I had the students reflect on um, the experiences. I also asked them a lot of questions about what things they liked and didn't like using the Liger skills, where they had, you know, didn't agree all the way up to agree, uh, strongly agree, that sort of thing. I also looked at pre and post learning games and that sort of thing. Um, but I really encourage you if that's something that you're sort of thinking through right now is to look at all that um, examples on the CERTL site. I think it's just like a new research field. You just have to see what's out there. So the more projects you can read and maybe ones you can find that will inspire you, you can see some examples of what other people have done. And that's also where I think having a mentor who has some or some scholarship of teaching and learning experience or also other peers can be really helpful to uh, sort of sort out what options there are and then what fits best with your project. Very good point. Yeah, um, right, so the ones that, that we use and we can tell you about won't necessarily fit with your project. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of people that you can kind of check in with to see what is out there rather than reinventing uh, any sort of measure. Well, um, we're going to start wrapping up now.